Last week, I, I spoke entirely to Lorna, okay? And this week, <laughs> the winners are, it's a bit like Anton Deck on a Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> this week, the living room that I have entered is Jill and Graham. So there you go. I'm afraid I, I, you've got, it's just you and me <laughs> this morning. But anyway, <clears throat> if you want to make a lot of money selling a Christian book, here's the tip. Write about the second coming. That's the way to do it. Uh, that will shift books. That will sell films. It will, it will even sell songs. But, uh, but the books that have been written about it over the years are many. And they do tend to make an awful lot of money because they're very sensational. There's lots of films, aren't there, about ap apocalyptic events, you know, the end of the world, whether it's some natural disaster, whether it's uh, uh, an asteroid hitting the planet, whether it's a nuclear war, whatever it might be. It kind of fascinates people. And I can remember way back in the 1970s, I told you last week, I became a Christian when I was a teenager. And uh, one of the things that I was particularly interested in most was the stuff about the second coming. Uh, and uh, there was a book out at the time called The Late Great Planet Earth. Those of you of a certain vintage may well have come across that. And at that time, they were trying to map things that were going on in that contemporary time to what the Bible had to say, picking out passages like Daniel, like Zechariah, bits in Revelation, bits of what Jesus is saying, and particularly Matthew 24, Luke 21. Uh, and and you, can, you can kind of Put that as a bit of tracing paper and put it over a contemporary society and say aha here you are and i can remember at the time the european union was called the uh, eec or maybe even the common market way back then uh, this i'm talking about 76 77 <clears throat> and um and there were 10 nations in it at the time and that seemed to to resonate with the picture of the beast with 10 heads you know in 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 revelation and then one one head rose above the others and and then it seemed to be mortally wounded and then recovered and people think oh gosh at that time someone tried to assassinate the pope uh so they're ah here we go so italy's part of the 10 so it's the, it's the pope the pope's the antichrist and um uh, then Ronald Reagan, there, there was an attempt on his life and he recovered and thought, oh, no, no, no. That obviously, it's going to be here. You know, it's going to be the United States. And then there was pictures of the bear that was talking about the, the, the way it describes nations as they're attacking Israel. It gives them kind of animal pictures. And one was the bear and people say, oh, yeah, that's Russia. Uh, and it's, it's very easy. And people have done it over the years, uh, mapped their contemporary situation onto these prophecies and try to join the dots. And you can make it fit. And that's not to say that we shouldn't be aware of what's going on uh, and we shouldn't look for the signs. We certainly should, because this is what Jesus is encouraging uh, his people there and us to be doing, is to be alert, to be aware, to understand that Jesus is coming back, to understand that the circumstances that surround that and precede that are gonna be really difficult. They're gonna be times of tribulation. Um, and so he's he's warning us through these passages that that is what it's going to be like. You can never accuse Jesus of overselling Christianity. He didn't sort of scrub all the you know the hard bits out and say, yeah, follow me and everything's going to be brilliant. It's going to be amazing. He says, follow me and people are going to persecute you. You know, people are going to put you to death. He said, even your family, they're going to turn you back on you. You know, <laughs> he's not saying this is easy. I mean, you, you might have thought people might have said, well, actually, geez, I'm not really up for that. You know, I just want a quiet life, thanks. You know, can't we? Just just sing some nice songs around the campfire uh, and Jesus says no this is this is tough this is going to be hard but if you stand with me you will stand at the end and he was saying this not so that they would be frightened in fact he he says to them when you hear of wars and uprisings don't be frightened he says you mustn't fear this isn't the thing to be afraid of I'm not telling you to scare you I'm telling you so that you understand so that you have a certain degree of expectation so that when there is um, the disturbances that are going on in the world and outside the world too, that you will say, aha, yeah, this is what Jesus said. Okay, we don't need to be fearful because he said that this is going to happen. He said that he is going to come at the end. He said that we will stand and he said that we'll be safe with him for eternity. So our motivation should be one of hope and joy rather than fear and cowering. Uh, but it should also stimulate us to want to tell other people because you know the Bible tells us that God is holding this back uh, because he wants as many people to be saved as possible. And he calls us to be the ones who share our faith. And so it's not, we're not coming at this with a sense of fear and foreboding, even though it's pretty scary stuff. Because if you read the end, he wins. 
So it's all about whose side are you on? Yeah, are you standing with Jesus or are you standing somewhere else? Are you standing on your on your own strengths, uh, by your own pride, by your own achievements, by your own resources? Or are you prepared to humble yourself and accept Jesus as Lord? That's that's really the question. And that is the issue when we're confronted with the reality of what God says about the end of the world. So let's have a, have a bit of a, a run through it <clears throat> and see what he has to say, because Jesus does something that occurs in the Old Testament as well. It's kind of a theme of the way the Bible looks at things. It, it kind of talks about things that are happening and things that will happen at the same time. And, and that makes some of this passage quite difficult to understand because he's, he's talking about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in, in AD 70, but he's also talking about his second coming. And you find that a lot in the, in the old passages in, in Daniel, Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. There are things that are contemporary situations, but they're also pointed to a future um, thing that was going to happen as well. And so it, that's why it can be a little bit confusing. And we have to try and sort of unpack that. Well, why is it doing that? I mean, it's deliberate. It's, it's saying that these things that you experience now are a foretaste of what's to come. So Jesus is saying, Jesus says to the disciples, if you remember last week, they were wondering about um, looking at the temple, saying how amazing it was, how brilliant it was. And Jesus basically said, you're focusing on the wrong thing. All this is going to be rubble. Yeah, this is going to be rubble. And when that happens, that is a foretaste of what's coming way in the future. So some of this they would experience and see. Some of it will be reserved for the generation at the end time. So let's have a, have a quick whiz through it, if you can, if you're with Luke uh, 21. And we sort of backtrack one or two verses that we looked at last week as well, just to get the, the context of the sense of it. So, so there they are, the disciples wandering around looking at this um, Jesus delivers this bombshell saying, hey, yeah, the temple's great. Do you know what? AD 70, or he didn't give the date, but it's going to be flattened. Uh, and it was. And they say, when's it going to happen? What's going to happen? And I, I do remember why I started talking about the, the 70s and me being a Christian and, and um, uh, the interest in the second coming. I remember we had a um, we had a Christian union uh, at school, which is basically like a, a little Bible meeting in school. And it was very poorly attended because it's not particularly cool, you know, at school to go to a Christian meeting. Um, and so we probably had about eight or nine people that used to go every week. And um, for some reason, the teacher let me have a go at doing it. And, uh, and so I put this thing in the notices that went around with the register. Um, if you want to find out what the Bible has to say about the end of the world, come to the Christian Union at so-and-so time and all the rest of it. And to my amazement, when I walked into that room, it was packed. It was standing room only. Uh, I don't know how many people we had, but, uh, you know, and so here am I. I hardly know anything anyway. Uh, and I now have to talk to this whole bunch of people who want to know from me what the Bible says about the second coming. So I probably knew more about it when I was 17 than I do now, to be honest. But the thing was, it does whet people's appetites. People get really into this and interested in it. But perhaps we... We don't learn the reason why God is warning us. We just focus on the warning and the kind of the uh, excitement or, I don't know, the drama of the apocalyptic visions. But anyway, so what does Jesus say when they ask this question? Because they want to know this as well. Their reaction is the same as those kids at school. And the reaction of a lot of people when they think about apocalyptic events, they think, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign? So give us a date. And how will we know? How will we get ready? The first thing that Jesus says, what's the first thing he says? Watch out that you're not deceived. Yeah? He doesn't even say, don't worry, don't be afraid. He says, the first thing, don't be deceived. Why? Because there's loads of people that are going to come in my name saying, I'm the saviour, I'm the one, I've got the understanding, I've got some special revelation that no one's had before, God's given it to me, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the voice of God, I'm the prophet in this generation, and they will say the time is near. And what does he say? Don't follow them. And there's been loads of them, and there still are, who claim to have a specific insight, a particular revelation. Um, and Jesus says, don't be deceived. Why would he say that? Because there's a danger that we can be. 
He wouldn't say it if, if it wasn't a danger. If it was so ridiculous, that, oh, no one would ever believe that, then we need not fear. But actually, there's going to be a lot of truth mixed with a lot of invention. And some of it is honest mistakes. You know? People look at these things, and um, or we'll get into it in a moment, but they, they look at triggers and they think, yeah, this is the sign. We're, we're living in the end times. And the reality is, ever since Jesus died on the cross, we've been living in the end times. But God is far more patient than we are. And his end times take a little longer than we might like. Yeah, For him, a day is a thousand years. So God's not so preoccupied with the timetable as we would like to be. Uh, he doesn't give us dates. He doesn't give us precision. Because if he did, that's all we'd be thinking about. He wants us to focus on other things. It's to, so what? So this is going to happen. So what? Which is, how are you going to be? What are you going to do? How are you going to live? And that's why he, God's been quite happy that Christians through all the generations have always thought that they were living in the last days. Because that's how he wants us to be living. He wants us to be conscious that Jesus is coming back. He wants us to be conscious that time is short. It's very easy to get caught up in the ways of the world and our own calendar and our own diary and our own ambitions and aspirations. And he says, no, I want you to have mine. I want you to see the world through my eyes, with my perspective. I want you to see the world as full of people who are lost and don't know they're loved, full of people who need forgiveness and healing and restoration. That's what I see when I see the world, whereas, says God, when we see it, we see it as obstacles to overcome. We see it as a career to work out. We see it as savings to be made. We see it as holidays to enjoy. We see it as comfort to accumulate. We see it as possessions that kind of define who we are, a car on the driveway, the, the house, whatever it might be. There are many things that captivate us and can dominate us. And they're not all bad things, but God's saying, don't get life out of perspective see it from my perspective what i've saved you from and what i've called you for what i've saved you from is eternal separation from me you don't know what hell looks like but we know it is separation from god he says i don't want that i don't want that for you i don't want that for them but time is going to come to an end and when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a great day or a terrible day. And it all depends on how in this life we respond to the call of Jesus. Not respond to the threat of the second coming or how we see it or the opportunity of the second coming. Um, but how we respond to him. So he says, so there's a number of kind of general prophecies in here, but he says the first thing he says to these disciples, well, here's one thing for you. <clears throat> there's going to be loads of people saying they know the time is near. They, are, they have special revelation. They may even claim to be the savior. Don't follow them. He says, you're going to have wars and rumors of wars and uprisings. Don't be frightened. Well, we know there's always been wars. Uh, I, I, I saw something that, that looked at, the number of wars between um, 360 um, BC and today is something like 15,000, 15,000 wars. You can add them up. And if you took the money that was spent on waging those wars, you could put a gold band around the world, 100 miles wide and 30 feet thick. If you put all the money that's been spent, imagine what we could have done as, as people, as humanity. If we turned our back on war and sought peace and gave the investment that we would have given to war and put that into peace, we wouldn't have a nation of need. We wouldn't have poverty. We wouldn't have famine. We'd be sharing. We'd be giving. We wouldn't have nations scrabbling over vaccines and arguing over if they've ordered too much or got too little or what order they're going to get them in and all the rest of it. We'd be able to provide. But we don't live by those principles, do we? We live by the principles of me first. And we do that personally and we do that nationally. But anyway, so he says you're going to hear wars, but remember parallel passages, Mark 13, uh, Matthew 24, <clears throat> Jesus likens it to childbirth, um, i.e. the pains of childbirth, where you, uh, I mean, I, now I don't speak from experience here clearly, but I understand pregnant women have pains from time to time. But there are certain pains which they know are, this is it. This is it. The baby's coming. 
there are pains that are recognizable and they increase in frequency and intensity. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, there, there are signs here. Conflict has always been, has always been present in humanity, but wars, they're gonna increase, they're gonna intensify, they're gonna become more frequent. The same is gonna happen with earthquakes, famines, pestilences. Okay, we've got a pestilence now. There's nothing particularly new about that. There's been pestilences before. There's been the Black Death. I'm sure when the Black Death was going on, people were saying, here it is, Jesus is coming back. You know, this is it. But it doesn't mean, we're, I'm not saying he's not coming back. I'm just saying, it's intensity, it's frequency. We're to expect these things. So when we think, well, why is this happening? Why God, why is this happening? Well, here you go, Luke 21, Jesus said it was gonna happen. When those earthquakes happen, why is it happening? It's because we live in a broken world. It's because we live in a broken world that's decided to spend all its wealth on me, me, my nation, conflict, war, rather than peace, giving and sharing. And it's reflected in the natural condition of the world as well as our own spiritual condition as humanity. Um, and then fearful events and great signs from heaven. So, but before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They'll hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison and you'll be brought before kings and governors on account of my name. So he's talking, remember he's talked about the, the temple. This is what started this discussion, yeah? And he, so he's talking about personally, these things are going to happen to them. And that's exactly what happens to them. If we read later on in the New Testament, we read about how Christians were uh, martyred um, for his name. We know that in AD 70, uh, the temple was uh, destroyed. It was flattened. Um, and ever since then, the, it was the day of the Gentiles. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles, he says in verse 24, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, well, since AD 70, uh, there was no Jewish nation until 1948. Yeah, there was Jewish people, but there was no Jewish state. There was no state of Israel until 1948. Now, people say 1948, that's the trigger. That's when that started the process when Jesus is coming back. But they didn't actually have Jerusalem until 1967. So people would say, ah, there you go. They got Jerusalem. That means Jesus is coming back in this generation. But actually, they haven't got the whole of Jerusalem. It's not fully theirs. So maybe then it will be. But there's always these triggers that can make us think, ah, Jesus is coming back. And that's great if our reaction to them is to be faithful, to be watchful, to be prayerful. But it's not great if our response to that is to be fearful, because if it is, that tells us something about our spiritual condition before God. If, that, if our reaction to the second coming is one of fear, then that's a good thing in a way, because it's, it's saying that you need to get right with God. You need to be at peace with God. Let's leave that thought with you. Okay, um, <clears throat> right, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, sisters, relatives and friends in verse 16. They'll put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. It's not a great sale, is it? But then he says this, verse 18, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. What on earth does that mean? When he's just said that people are going to hate you, betray you, and they'll put some of you to death, and then next line, but not a hair of your head will perish. Because he's talking about your status before God, your, your soul. Now, we started with that verse from Romans, which nothing can separate you from the love of God. And he's saying they, they, can, they can kill you. They can take your body, but they cannot take your soul. Your soul is safe. Your spirit is safe with God. Your eternal destiny is secure, which is why he's saying, <clears throat> don't fear, because there's all sorts of things that can happen in this world. People could turn their backs on you, people can call you things, people can slander you, there will be suffering. He doesn't say that Christians won't suffer, but he does say that if you stand with him, your eternal destiny is secure. And that's what he's saying is have hope, not fear because your hope is in the one who overcomes all things, that Jesus, who will come back one day in complete glory, power, and authority. 
Verse 27, at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So when these things begin to take place, these things that he's been talking about, about wars, famines, earthquakes, natural disaster, persecution of the church, all these things which did come true and are coming true and still will come true, yeah, because they are a foretaste of what's to come. Jesus says, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. See, most people's reaction to war, earthquake, pestilence, persecution is actually to lower your heads, isn't it? Isn't it to lower your head before, below the parapet? Is Don't draw attention to yourself. There's, I go to church, but I keep it private. It's personal. It's actually to shrink. It's to begin to doubt. It's to begin to get caught up with fear. But Jesus says, no, when these things happen, you stand. When these things happen, you lift up your heads. Lift up your heads because your redemption is near. That redemption that Big Daddy Wee was singing about earlier. That redemption, which means that you're a child of God, which means that you are eternally safe, which means that you have a heavenly father who loves you and knows all about you, who has a heavenly father who's going to be faithful to you through suffering, because suffering produces character it produces hope it enables us actually to trust him more if we stay with him but like psalm 23 if you remember david said though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i won't fear evil why because you're with me and david said i don't get stuck in the valley of the shadow of death i go through it why because you're with me David doesn't say, thank you, God, that I didn't have to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Thank you, God, that you rescued me from, from that. You made life really easy for me, so I didn't have to go through suffering. I didn't have to go through pain. I didn't have to go through darkness. David doesn't say that. And David doesn't even say, I forgive you for the valley of the shadow of death. I forgive you for the hard times that I had, God. Now he says, no, I thank you for it. Because they showed me that you're with me in any and every situation, every circumstance of life. They showed me that nothing can separate me from your love. So I will look back on that time in the valley of the shadow of death and know that it strengthened me. It strengthened my trust in you. Because you delivered me from it. The hardest thing of all, isn't it, is to trust him in it. And it's easier when we look back on it. But when we're in it, it's really hard. And that's why God gives us these examples. That's why God gives us these people, these ordinary people with failings and weaknesses like you and me. And he did it for them and he'll do it for you. And he gives us these warnings because he says, you can stand, stand firm in me because whatever happens, whatever things shake, whatever uncertainties seem to happen in society and in, in the universe and all the rest of it, I'll be faithful to my word because heaven and earth will pass away. Notice that. But he said, my words will never pass away. Verse 33. So how do we, how do we respond to the idea that Jesus is coming back, that there's going to be a, an end of time. There's going to be a, there's going to be this tribulations. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be conflict surrounding Jerusalem. Uh, just as it was in AD 70, Jesus says that's a foretaste of what's to come. When it all happens, it's going to be focused on Jerusalem once again, that Jesus is going to come onto the Mount of Olives. It's going to be this massive earthquake and all the rest of it, all this drama, all this is going on. What does Jesus say we should do? How should we prepare? Well, he says, be careful. He says, don't be afraid. And he says, be careful. Or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. So it'll only close suddenly on you like a trap if you get caught up in the things of the world. If, you become full, if your life becomes full and preoccupied by the anxieties of this life. Have I got enough? Have I accumulated enough? Is my reputation good enough? What's my standing? I don't know what it might be. How's my bank balance? 
if we focus on the anxieties of life, then this is going to like, come like a trap. It's going to shock us, surprise us, because we've taken our eye off the ball. Jesus is saying, don't take your eye off the ball. The ball is me. See, we can get caught up in the prophecy and forget the source of the prophecy. Jesus says, you look at me. You don't need to fear. All this is going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I'm going to win because I'm God. So put your hand in my hand. Trust me. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the earth. Be always on the watch. So it doesn't mean, oh, let's pretend it's not going to happen. We can't figure it out. It's all too complicated because it is complicated. <laughs> but Jesus tells us what we need to know, not perhaps as much as we would want to know. Be on the watch, recognize when these things are happening and pray that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen, that you may stand before the Son of Man. So our response to the thought of Jesus coming again, well, first of all, is it, is it fear or is it joy? Maybe it's somewhere in between, but I'd say if it's fear, that tells you that you need to get right with God because God says, you need not fear it if you're with me. He says, be watchful. He says, recognize what's going on in society. Recognize what's going on in the universe. Because some of this stuff is cosmic, isn't it? He talks about um, uh, on the earth, nations will be in anguish. There'll be signs in the sun, moon, and the stars. So there's, there's kind of cosmic events that are going to be going on. When, when this is happening, recognize it. Don't fear it, but recognize it's the signs that Jesus is coming back. And pray. So watch and pray and do not fear. There are three great ways to live, aren't they? To watch, to focus on God, not on ourselves. To pray, to bring to him our concerns, our needs, our worries and all the rest of it. And do not fear. Well, I pray that that will be um, our experience. I've gone on far too long, haven't I? I've gone far, well, I've carried away there. Anyway, I can, the good thing is I'm watching Jill and Graham and I can tell you they haven't fallen asleep at all. So that's, I'm, very, I'm terribly impressed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to play a song that I guess could only play this one really. I'm gonna share this one as our last song of the morning and then I'll pray and then I'm off to Christchurch. Um. <laughs> 